Welcome to Schmidt List, where we inspire and educate emerging leaders by bringing you conversations with the best experts and thought contributors in technology and design. Thank you for joining us today. Now let's listen in as your host, President at Foundry, Kurt Schmidt, speaks with this episode's inspiring leader. Aaron, how are you today? Very good, Kurt. Very good to see you. Thank you <laughs> for having me you. on the show. I'm so excited that you're here. So Aaron, tell me about Capsule. Tell me about the work you do and, and who do you do it for? Yes, we are a special projects agency. So we do a number of types of special projects for clients like Patagonia, Hydroflask, Arcteryx, brands like PepsiCo, mm. a variety of others locally and nationally. And, and there are a variety of these really interesting, challenging special projects that either the clients don't have the capacity or the capability to get at. And so we go in and help them with an agile team to accomplish those projects. That's so fun. It sounds like a fun, fun, fun job. It is. Fun, it is. Fun, it's a fun, different fun problem every day. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Never bored, right? No. 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 Boredom is not an option. No. Yeah. Boredom is not an option. Well, let's talk about boredom for a second because segue, segue. The, the goal these days, it seems that more and more people are focused in terms of marketing. In the last 20 years, it's moved from display advertising and ad purchasing to creating content. And the reason uh, it feels like behind that content shift is because you're trying to create a brand that is an essential part of your day-to-day -day life, not just something you you pick up and use and dispose of and it, it, it's interchangeable with whatever, right? This, this ketchup, that ketchup, I don't care. As long as it's got tomatoes and sugar in it, I'm fine. But what I see more and more people, and I hear people talking about this, right? There's a there's a, a thing, a famous thing, right? If you create a thousand fans, you'll be set for life or something. And so people do talk about this advocacy and this fandom. Where does that come from, Aaron? Where, why is that so important to companies these days? Well, and this is a great intro into this conversation as you relate to content. And I believe that the brand is the original content. And if the brand is built with personality in from the beginning, you've got content forever, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about what Liquid Death is currently doing in water, I would bet that they got to their thousand fans, fanatical fans, faster than anybody has ever gotten there, right? Because, I mean, you're carrying around what looks like alcohol. And if you're an NA drinker, which is growing dramatically, you're here, you know, they've got that fan. If they've got just fan base of people that have, they'd love personality and brands. Often the piece that, that brands nowadays, when you say like this mm -hmm. ketchup or that ketchup, those aren't brands anymore. If it's just a commodity, if it's, I don't mm -hmm. care which one, if you get to that place, then, and it can happen at any given point in time too. That's what people don't think about it. Like you can, you can stop investing, you can stop putting energy and thought and love into a brand. And over time it ages and it, and it, and it doesn't have as much relevancy and it loses that connection to those financial fans because they wonder, where have you gone? How come you're not keeping current? How come you're not my brand? Or you take a shift left or right on them and they're like, you don't fit me anymore. This is mm -hmm. weird. This is different, right? And so, yeah, it is. It, it starts with baked right into the brand. It's got to have a lot of personality. It's got to be knowing who it is and what it means in the world to be present in order to to have a place in my life right? and to place in our life as, as consumers of these brands. Yeah, that Definitely makes sense. Critical. Well, in, in, and obviously that leads to what we're, what all companies are hoping for is, is rep more revenue and growth and all of those things. But do you find that, what is the biggest problem? What's the biggest barrier that some of these companies are having to creating these fanatical fans? Where, where do things, where do you see the problem becoming really relevant? Does it, does it matter if it's a newer brand or an older brand, or does that have play any factor into it? What, what are your thoughts on what are some of the problems that companies are experiencing in creating those fanatical fans? Yeah, it doesn't really matter if it's old or new. There's definitely a, a preference now for more heritage and, and having something more history, have more history, therefore nostalgia, authenticity right? is drawn from that nostalgia. Yeah, things like that. But you still, you still need to have the fundamentals of a personality and some longevity in people's lives and co to continue to be relevant and, mm. and worthy to them. 
And what I see is the, is the barriers. One, they see people as, as segments, as, as audiences, not as people, not as human beings. They see their brand as, as a thing, not, not a, taking human form and having a personality and, and representing who you are in the marketplace. The greatest line I heard from one of, one of our clients when they referred to their brand was Patagonia. Patagonia brand and Patagonia company are the same thing. And mm. I can say that I've been inside many times and it is very much the case. Patagonia, the brand and Patagonia, the company are the same thing. You, you, you don't go there and go, this is not what I thought they were, right? And literally going out of the campus, you can say, well, what does it matter that you want to campus? Most customers don't go out of the campus, but it proves the authenticity of that brand, right? They live it. If you want to go tour and see, they live it. It's everything in them, right? Down to the receptionist gentleman who, you know, has that long curly locks that looks like a surfer dude that's at the, <laughs> that's at the front desk. Right. And he sounds like that dude. Mm-hmm. It is, it just, it is Patagonia. Right. And you go, oh, they've done it right. Yeah. You know, because if you, once you stop thinking about those types of things, then everything starts to not matter as much. Well, we don't need to do this because that doesn't really matter. Well, we don't need to do this and that doesn't really matter. And all of a sudden that little slippery slope turns into like, what does matter to you that? Right. Let's go the other way. Like, let's design the inside of the iPhone, right? Let's design the inside of the iMac to make sure that that's properly designed. Who yeah. does that? Right. Right. I mean, that, that, makes that sense. kind of crazy thinking is go on the other side, go skew. If you're going to skew, skew on the other side of maybe more things matter versus less. Right. 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 Uh, because if you signal that love, if you signal that love, signal that love for your product, for your experience, whatever you're doing, People pick up on it. They don't maybe, maybe pick up on it explicitly, but they definitely implicitly figure out that you really care about this, right? I mean, you look at Liquid Death and you write, you read what they write on the back of their cans. You're like, someone spent some time like writing that. Someone that knows how to write a sentence. Hmm. And on the most of back, most packages on the back, it's like, this. Why did you get me to read that? Why did you put those words there? They don't even <laughs> deserve. They don't deserve the ink. You know, it, uh, that's the kind of it's a waste of ink. It is not a waste of ink. There's a hmm. lot of things that are a waste of ink. Just don't do it. Yeah. Right. Well, and this isn't a new concept, right? Because I mean, history shows, I mean, we've had the uh, Marlboro man, we had Betty Crocker, the Pillsbury Doughboy, but why is it more important these days than it was even back then in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s for these because those those people those things were almost mascots. They were almost off to the side of the brand, in in a way. How is that? How is it different today? And why does it why does it matter today more that the, the because again you've got the Nike swoosh, but then you have the Michael Jordan brand, right? That are kind of inter intersected, but yet separate. You have you have Coca Cola and Pepsi, and you've got kind of these, it's the same sugar water, right? It's just different sort of approaches to things. Tell me, tell me about this. It's, there's this history that this has worked, but why are people nowadays, do you feel, seeing it being more important than ever before? Yeah. Well, the proliferation of brands, the proliferation of choices that we have, the, mm. the number of options out there definitely you know, out. creates... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, you got to stand out. You got to be present. But, you know, we have choices in our lives and we have, we want to, we're drawn to the things that are like more immersive experiences, more relevant in our lives, you know, might connect with our values. There's a variety of things that you can use to connect with people. It isn't all of those and it isn't just one of those, but you definitely have more opportunities. You know, and and, and the, the level of transparency where you can see deep into a brand and see what's going on inside that organization. I mean, the more in love you are with the brand, the more you want to know about what's going on behind the scenes. You want, right? I mean, do you go from, you know, I buy this particular car. Now I'm all the way to the level of I'm going to go on a tour at the factory when I get my car. I mean, you've reached the fanatical fan level, but there are a lot of options out there for me, right? For me to and start mm-hmm. down that path of falling in love with the brand. And, and there's a lot of things. And there's also, this the thing that's always flight to you is price, right? And it's like, well, the next discount, well, I could get this one, this car for $10,000 left or something, right? Yeah. I just moved out of the BMW family into the Tesla family. Mm. And I literally am referring to them in that way in my head. Like I, I've always been, I tried to get out of BMW. And every time I tried to get out of BMW, he's like, no, Audi's no, just not nice. Feel They're right. not nice people. <laughs> 
doesn't feel right. I don't, I don't like the people, you know? And then I, and then all of a sudden Tesla comes in and I'm like, it wasn't about necessarily the people. It was about the technology. It was like mm-hmm. everything was easy. It was just, I literally bought the car on my iPhone, bought the car insurance on my iPhone. <laughs> I mean, I have interfaced with one person barely. And if you've been to a car dealership in the last 50 oh, years, not interacting with people like car dealerships is like a yeah. joy. Yeah. I mean, that out of your life, it's, you know. So anyway, yeah, it is, it's uh, today's culture is too many options or many options. Maybe not too many that's judgmental of, because I think there's probably going to be more and more options for mm. people, different category. And brands have to find ways to authentically connect. They have to be, they have to be rooted in something, yeah. right? Anchored Makes in sense. something. So, well, so yeah, there's a there's a famous talk Malcolm Gladwell did about like how Prego and all these companies went from just regular spaghetti sauce to like a million different kinds of spaghetti sauce on the shelf, one for everybody to choose if you like it chunky, if you like it with extra garlic, and you know, whereas it was just spaghetti sauce before. And what I see with the business owners I speak with today, Aaron, the the biggest one of the biggest sh- hurdles that they have to get over with is that they can't be everything to everybody. So I do talk to these business owners and they're like, well, but yeah, I mean, yes, the guy who does construction uses my 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 product, but also this 17-year-old snowboarder uses it. So I don't want to pick one. I don't want to pick one audience to go after. Mm-hmm. How do you coach people mm-hmm. and brands through those that indecision, Aaron? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, the classic marketer line that I've had for years was you market to a select few, but you sell to anyone. And Red Wing Shoes exemplifies that as another client done a little before they, they have they have their base of customers and clients that they sell to a lot of oil riggers, a lot of construction in that category where it's hardworking, it's a hardworking boot, and that great they market, right? They market to them. They do market to teenager in Tokyo who buys boots for $800 a pair, right? That's just not, that's not the place. If they want to buy them at $800, well, that's great. And they do. They sell a lot of very, very premium boots to other markets, but that isn't in their marketing mix because they don't need it to be in their marketing mix. And honestly, it's more authentic for you to market to a select few and sell to anyone. Anyone can enter and become and connect with the brand, but the brand has a certain direction and a certain group of people, they say, these are, we've designed these for you, right? These other people, they might want it, but we've designed these for you, right? That's an important part of the conversation. And then that's why when people are like, well, yeah, I've got, I appeal to these people and I appeal to these people and I, that's okay. But who are the people that you want and you know that are going to be there that have this the longevity to be loyal to you for a long period of time? And what is that population, right? Because fashion mm-hmm is dangerous. Fashion goes and goes away, comes and goes, right? And so if you're, if you're like the fashionable boot, danger, <laughs> danger, right? <laughs> if you're at the top of the All heap, of sudden, you might want to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Someone can either knock you off or you're not going to be fashionable for whatever reason. It's a fickle area. But if you're the hardworking boot, it always works. That is almost a legacy boot. Like you hand it down to your kids kind of boot. And that isn't a good, you know, business strategy because you can't sell enough, enough boots, but it works out, right? It's a, it's a healthy business for sure. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, 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 that's what I prescribe to. And that's what I advise. I try to find that group that is your group that you can consistently, and it, it may not be the proper mix of like this demographic and that demographic. It may be an odd mix of people, right? Don't just see people by their demographics and even their psychographics, right? See them as wholly as you possibly can, because that, that can, that can tell you something that, and can allow you to focus in different ways. Because there's so many data points you can gather and so many ways to go to market nowadays that you can find so many data points on people and say, well, these are our thousand people or these are our 10,000 people. You know, if we get them, they'll talk about us, they'll, they'll rave about us, they'll continually buy from us. That's what we need. If you like about Apple and the origin, right? Back in the, the old days, right, of Apple, I was at a meeting with a client this is 2000, 2000, I think. Mm. And uh, yeah, and I, we were presenting a strategy for product development, product design, yeah. the technology company, basically in the wireless. I won't name the company because I don't want to embarrass them because this was an embarrassing statement for them. And the CEO, afterwards, we said, well, you should, 
think about the design of your technology, because at the time, you know, the aesthetic of the machines wasn't as important at all or at all. I mean, it was just, you know, Apple For brought sure. that about, you know, right? And it became, because the technology got a parity, right? What you, the, the processing power and everything get to a parity level. So said the design of the, of the devices in our lives is going to become more important, right? What you put on your desk at your house, it's kind of like, I don't want this ugly looking machine on my desk, right? And so we said, you should look at Apple. You should work with a, an industrial design firm and you should see where they're going. Well, this is before Apple, Steve Jobs had just come back. And the CEO looked at me and he said, Apple is irrelevant in this town. And I'm like, oh. In this town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I went, this in Silicon Valley. And I was like, oh, that kind of hurts, you know? And I'm like, but no, I think they're not. But then, of course, they went where they did and, and where they are now. I'll create after them. And I can tell you the client we worked with exists, but right. they're not that mm-hmm. um, Right. Um, not a lot of growth made, happened in the signal. The <laughs> not a lot of growth there, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that is, it's, and if there's a group that had, had a fanatical fan base that they built upon, it was definitely out. If you look at when people are like, well, it's design, it's a certain aesthetic, and there's all kinds of other things, or it's just the product that they designed that they, they were successful on. I don't know there was any, entirely any one of those things. I think they had a fanatical fan base that kept with, kept them alive, kept them going. And then, and then more people showed up and went, mm-hmm. oh, I can be, I can be cool like these kids are. Um, right. Yeah. So. Right. Well, in startup world, which, you know, we, at Foundry, we play a, a bunch in, you also have to be open to pivoting very quickly, right? Because you, you might say, okay, this is for HR directors in enterprise companies or this is a communication tool for engineers and all of a sudden you know you've got slack which was built and then for a communication tool for engineers and then next thing you know it is it is a tool for enterprise communication and and all these things so you do have to be open to that what sort of things do you look for aaron when you're working with a company that maybe says this is the this is the group that we've sort of defined what sort of key factors do you look for where there might be an area that they might be missing? Well, how do they find that? Is it through, is it through data? Is it through user interviews? What have you, what techniques or tools have you found that have helped people undercover, uncover that? There's a couple of things that feed into that. And yes, I completely agree on the, the keeping, I, I will literally say to people as they're launching new things, we don't know the audience yet. I mean, right. you can theorize, you can believe you know it, <laughs> but the best thing you can possibly do is say, I don't know. I have no idea. And that's good to not know because you'll know more later and you'll fill those gaps in later. And it's better that you do that instead of getting stuck in an audience because you can spend on an audience for too long. And they'd be like, all these, all these people over right. the years here are purchasing us for this reason. Well, we don't care. We're to ignore them. We're like, really? Because <laughs> they love you. <laughs> how about, how about we go talk to them? Is there, they're crazy? I don't know. I think they're buying you. Anyway, and, and it can, we can get myopic and we can, we have all our own biases coming into this. No matter how smart you are as a marketer, you have your own biases. You come in like, I think it's going to be this audience. I can tell you how many times I've seen startups and entrepreneurs do that. You're like, I know exactly who I'm a designer is for. Yes, you'd think you do, but these people know better and they're buying. So make some sell slump some is what I, what I take, which is a standard, like, you know, an agile startup approach. You know, you make as little as you possibly can, experiment, see where things go, minimum wild product, all these types of things that allow you to see where the marketplace is, right? And then continue to just adapt to where does that marketplace develop? And where do you get those indications of not just first purchase, but second purchase? And then eventually like, I really love this product. I will be mm-hmm. with you for the rest of my life kind of loyalty. And they won't tell you that. The better thing is that they'll signal that, right? That they go right. to your logo on their body or they... You know, they rave about you to their friends. You know, you hear that kind of stuff. You're like, okay. And it's better to study five of those people than to study a thousand of the ones that purchase you once, mm-hmm. right? Because they're, you know, like, how come we can't, you know, that's, that's just, it's better right. to find those people that yeah, are, that are have their stuff, propensity to be fanatical fans. Well, that's the thing. You're, you're probably doing things that you, that are maybe just inherent to your culture that you don't even know are those signals to those people in if you could amplify now those signals in a broader way and i've seen lots of companies be very successful with that where it's just kind of part of who they were they, who they were right like zappos was famous for it right they were just inherently very customer service oriented as an organization and then they realized that 
that turned people into fans. And so they're like, oh, let's amplify it and let's talk about it and let's write a book about it. Let's go on talks and speaking events about it. It wasn't necessarily the game plan from the beginning to be like, oh, we're going to be we're going to be known as the customer centric company or something. But to your point, I think they noticed these signals of people really appreciated their approach and really glommed onto it and, and they took off with it. Do you find yeah. that, so speaking of being fanatical fans, in today's world, we can also pay for those fans. We have influencers now as part of the sort of, you know, marketing sphere, the global sphere. I just want to get your take on somebody who's been doing this for a while. What's your take on the importance of influencers in a product's brand? Is it is it a passing phase? Is it an important piece? What is it? What do you see happening in the influencer market and how should I be thinking about it as, as a brand or a business owner um, in the yeah, future? Yeah, yeah, it is definitely a valuable piece in the mix. I don't want to discount it too much, but it is, I mean, if you look at it, it's historically, it's celebrities. What's nice about it is you've got micro celebrities, right? You've got the, yeah, it's almost like you've got a local celebrity in a way. It's people that are very influential with a, with a group of people, how influential they are, how much they actually want to be people do things. But I always push back and say earned trust and earned loyalty is more valuable than paid for, right? So if you're paying for it through somebody and they're only loyal to you because you have this, you know, influencer in your mix, <laughs> then, you know, if that influencer brings a lot and that influencer decides you're not their people anymore that I want to be with, or that influencer does something they shouldn't have done and that shows up in some way, then you're attached to that as well. So anything that comes with celebrity you're basically borrowing off of somebody else's equity, right? And borrowing off of somebody else's earned trust and loyalty. And then hopefully it transfers over to you, but make sure that you are your own, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't have that down, if you don't have something that's fundamentally strong and have the ability to earn that loyalty, then the celebrity doesn't matter. The, the classic line in, in advertising is the fastest way to kill a really bad product is a really good ad campaign. Right, because everybody tries it once and then goes, I'm never going back. Right. And no, what I'm what I'm really fascinated, not to tie us to current culture of what's going on right now, but if you've seen all the media coverage around the movie Barbie, oh sure. Like, it is it is profound. I've never seen in my years on this planet the amount of media, the amount of I was in New York and there was a pop up restaurant at a at the Barbie restaurant with, you know, selfie spots and all over there. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> You know, and then people say, you know, the amount, I don't know how it can live up to the hype, but maybe it can. I don't know. We're going to see, right? We're going to see very soon. But it's one of those that like, <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, that's that's a big yep. one. Yeah, uh, that's that's one. that's, this, that's this, omni-channel on steroids, right? <laughs> it is, it is. But then, you know, they've got, you know, kind of like Pokemon, they have a lot of fanatical fans. They have people that are really big fans of that brand. You know, and they're and then nostalgia and the oh, connect back to, yeah. you know, we're talking like generational connections there to that brand, which makes it really fascinating. So it could, you know, it could definitely achieve that. I'm seriously wondering how it's possible just because of how much yeah. hype, you know, yeah. but yeah, we'll see. We'll, see. well it feels like Very in so. those sorts of situations, you almost have to, you almost have to over hype. It's like, I almost look at it like, you know how you do speaking events and, and things, right? And they are always like, oh, 100 people registered, but you know, like 30 people are going to show up. I almost feel like it's a similar situation of like, well, we have to estimate for, you know, 100 million people to see the movie. So 20 million people see the movie or something, right? Right, um, right, it, right. It feels, it feels yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. So, no. so, so, okay, we covered that. And, and so the last thing I want to ask, Aaron, you know, is... You know, Capsule, like you mentioned, is is known for special projects and, and things like that, right? If I am thinking about maybe sort of this brand launch, product launch, or a brand relaunch, whatever the case may be, I'm going to do something out of the norm for my organization, something a little outside the box, and we're nervous about it, and, and, and we're concerned about it. What are the things I should be taking into consideration if I'm going to launch a new campaign, a new towards a new audience, a new product? What are some of the first things I should be thinking about? Because there is so, like I mentioned the term omnichannel, right? There's so many different ways to approach this. I can do paid advertising. I can do SEO. I can do influencer marketing. I can do email marketing. I've got, there is 
there is no shortage of tools in the tool set right now. How do I know or how do I how do I figure out what is the best way to first how do I figure out which tools to use, Aaron? Where, where, where do I how do I start? And I know I know it depends. I know the answer is usually it depends, but give me an idea of what sort of questions do you ask do you ask people to ask themselves in that situation? Yeah, yeah. Well, there are it's the it's the spectrum of most efficient to most effective or in, in some cases, most. Uh, the graph. The, the right, graph of, right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> right. Right. But on, on, on one side, the most immersive, right? The more, the more you can touch people, not in a way that you're just bombarding them with emails or bombarding them with text messages, but can you get them a proper mix, right? So that they're seeing the brand in a bunch of different mediums, in a bunch of different environments, in a bunch of different contexts. If there's something that Barbie has done great, it's like they've hit you in every place possible medium out there where you can get a little bit of tease of the brand. So the more immersive is generally going to be the more effective versus the more efficient, which is like, let's use, you know, one. And we're, we're tool agnostic across the board when it comes to what we're, what we're putting together as far as a mix. So we don't like to say one is better than the other. Each has their purpose. When a proper mix should be as immersive as possible in that experience. So versus just, just one and, and, and extremely cost effective. Right. Because it, 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 people know it's cheap to send an email. Right. People know that it's cheap to send a text. Right. And so you haven't you haven't done a lot by just doing a te text broadcast mm -hmm. to people. Right. Mm -hmm. Or an email blast to someone that they know that that's not an immersive thing. So having something that says and it also from a well, you the original part of your question. I would study that basic interaction between what you've got, your product, the brand, the offering, the mix of message and the people that you think are gonna connect with that, right? And what things bubble up for them? What are the things that, mm. and it is a, do you bring them a bit of joy? Do you bring them a bit of like some very emotional impact to them, right? And I, and I say that in emotional can be negative and positive. It can be like, if, if, you, if you study something and you go, well, we've got five people that hate it and five people that love it. That's better than 10 people that don't really care, right? So right. if you've got apathy, we've got a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. If you've got love and hate, let's go because you would well, let's study those five love and then see what they, what do they love about it? Let's go deeper mm -hmm. on that. Right. Because <laughs> and in many ways, the tools don't matter as much. Right. As long as you get to those people that love it, mm -hmm. finding who they are is most critical because there's just, there are so many tools to work with. And honestly, I, 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 I prescribe to experimentation. Marketing mm -hmm. is an experimentation. Right. There is no winning, absolutely winning tool. If there was, right, some would already have it and making billions. You could say that Amazon is closest to that and the Amazon ecosystem maybe is the closest to the, the winning formula. But outside of that, everything else is a small experiment. And even inside the Amazon ecosystem, it's still small experiments. Let's do this. Let's, you know, change these messages. Let's do these types of things. These small experiments that help you discover and learn and, and, and find that audience who's going to, mm. uh, who's going to become that fanatical fan. It makes sense. So, I, so okay. Now I, I know that was going to be my last question, but I have more because you really sparked something for me. Cause one thing we haven't talked about is the keeping up with the Joneses mentality is the, but my competition, mm. how many times, I mean, I'm sure you get people to come in and say, well, my competition is doing this. So I need to do that. Right. We, we get at Foundry, people are like, oh, I want to build an app. And I'm like, why do you want to build an app? And like, well, all my competitors have an app. And I'm like, mm, is that what you should do? How important is taking in the comp? So we've talked a lot about the customer and showing up correctly with the customer. How important is it to take into consideration the, the competitors? Yeah, it is, you know, they're definitely in the mix. They're definitely, you've got to learn from them, observe them. But if you're spending too much time looking backwards or to the side at competitors, you kind of lose your own direction of who you are. And so it's better to be looking at them as, you know, they're over there doing their thing because wherever they are now, they're going to shift from that moment. They're going to be going someplace else, right? Because I, in my business, and I think everybody's business, you're where you are, what people see right now is not who you are because you're already advancing beyond that point. Right. I, I, I worked for a Japanese design man when I first got into this business and Neki Yamamoto and he said, 
So you guys in this country are really into intellectual property and protecting things. In Japan, we're not much into that because we innovate. We just keep out in front of it. So if you want to steal something that I've got right now, fine, I'm already on to my next thing. So you're just stealing my old technology, right? It doesn't really matter, which I thought was a really good insight. It's like, if you want to keep advancing, you don't, you don't sit there and try to, oh, they're doing that. Let's go do that. Or like, and then you get there and you're like, why are we doing that? They're doing that over there. And it's like a zigzag approach to, to marketing, like find your own direction, find your own confidence in who you are and the audience you're for and go after that. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, you're, you're basically a follower, which is a strategy. There's a fast follower strategy that does make sense if you do it deliberately and just, just, and say, but then you have to be confident enough to say that I'm a follower and I'm okay with that. So whatever so-and-so does, I'm going to follow exactly what they do. And I'm going to be three steps behind them. Right. And it could be brilliant follower strategies. No doubt about it. Right. There's sure. Burger King versus McDonald's. It's, it's one of the best examples of that in the history of time uh, of a good follower strategy. Mm. But yep. It's got to be a deliberate strategy. Otherwise, you're kind of waffling back and forth. Same like mixed messages. Yeah, you're, yeah, and you're not, you might not be following the right people. You might change who you follow. You don't, right? Just have it be a deliberate strategy if you're going to take that approach or be a leader in your category because a leader doesn't have to look around as much, you know, because everybody's behind them, right? And that's like, it. that's a, can be seen as a bit of an arrogant or an overconfident approach to it. But no, it's just like, this is, this is what it is. We're going to do this. And we may be out there in a strange place. And everybody's looking at us and go, what are they doing? That's weird. <laughs> and I'm kind of okay with that myself. Yeah. But uh, I'm, a, I'm a quirky dude that way. Well, I'm that's a, how you get I, Red Bulls in liquid know. death, right? Right, right. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, think about how you had to, if you look at water before liquid death, it's like, you're going to do what? And you're going to call it what? <laughs> liquid death? <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine those investor conversations. Oh my what? gosh. What are we going to call them? Yeah. Right? Oh, that's definitely, yeah. you know, like most startups where they bet on the jockey and not on the, on the horse, right? They, it's like, right. okay, these, this team seems to know what they're doing. So I'll bet on them, whatever, right. call it, Fine. call it liquid life, liquid death. I don't care. <laughs> right. I, don't care. Right. <laughs> I like you guys so i'll give you some money to do stuff i think you'll be successful right uh, right yeah uh, nice been on the track well cool thanks aaron so much for taking the time out of your busy day i really appreciate you joining me on the show if i want to get in touch with aaron and i want to know more about a capsule and the work you do where should i go as a as a listener of the show and find out more information yes definitely go to capsule.us that's our website and then we're all over the socials from Twitter to Instagram to LinkedIn. LinkedIn, probably our biggest one. And you can find me, Aaron J. Keller, I believe, or Aaron Keller on LinkedIn. Not too hard at all. Yeah. Come find us there. Reach out. We'd love to, love to talk. Great. Well, again, Aaron, I appreciate it. I learned so much during this conversation. Thank you for all you've done for the, the community and, and the, the great business that you've, you've built. It's, it's really an inspiration. So thank you. Thank you for having me on the Schmidt list. Like I said, it's been the best Schmidt list I've ever been on. It's the best. My dad's and my mom's Schmidt list is not good. But this one is phenomenal. I love this place. <laughs> I appreciate that. We hope you join us for more conversations in the future with leading experts in technology and design. Please contact us at schmidt-list.com and foundrymakes.com for more information.